This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question, where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm pleased to introduce you to Ellen Nichols. Ellen grew up in the American Deep South, but with a spirit of adventure, she went up to Toronto, Canada for graduate school and stayed for 50 years. She has been writing or a living for years, but always for someone else. Her grant proposals, direct marketing letters, and especially her thank you letters are legend, and her persuasive writing skills raise millions of dollars. Those Canadians loved her tales about her Southern life so much that she decided to write them down, and they became her memoir, Remember Whose Little Girl You Are. And joining today, joining me today to talk about that and so much more is my guest, Ellen Nichols. Ellen, welcome to Uncorking a Story. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to hear, uh, have you here, Ellen, um, but I'm going to ask you the same uh, question as I ask everybody as we start these conversations, which is, Ellen, tell me, where does your story begin? Um, I was created in Foley, Alabama, but they didn't have a hospital, so I was actually born in Greenville, but in, you know, a couple of days after I was taken back to Foley, and so it all started in a little town called Foley, Alabama. And what was it like growing up in Foley, Alabama? Well, I don't remember that much of it because my dad was a Methodist minister. And back then in the Methodist church, they moved the ministers every three or four years. So I lived long enough in Foley to just vaguely remember the last few minutes of it. I found out later that Hank Williams was born there just down the street from. Oh, wow. Hey, good looking. <laughs> yeah. So I always liked his music. Yeah. Well, what's now it like? What's it like um, growing up with, uh, with a father who's a minister? Oh, you know, you have to move too often. Back then you did. The, with the longest we lived in one place was Pensacola, Florida. We lived there for seven years and that was exceptional. It, it was usually three if we were lucky four, but usually three years. And my mom was going to write a memoir if she hadn't passed away so young. Um, and she was gonna call it 10 times a stranger. And that could be my story too. Yeah. And to start all over every time. Wow. What was it like? I mean, how, how did that impact your, your life later on? How do you suppose that impacted your life later on? Um, I think it made me um, adept at talking to people I didn't know and knew people. I, I always joke about I could probably talk to a brick wall and it would answer me back <laughs> because I just learned that I, I had to make people like me. Yeah. A, a people pleaser, if you want to use it derogatory term yeah i know I, I hear that term it's not often used in in a positive uh, in a positive sense no. No. um what did you grow up wanting to be uh, back in those days do you know um i really never had an overriding desire to do anything in particular except that it was vaguely associated with medicine i did belong to the future nurses club I was elected to girl state, so I could have been a politician. Um, uh, but I ended up, I took a course on um, church related vocations as a good preacher's daughter. And I did end up in a church related vocation, which was uh, as a performance artist of, of the pipe organ. Oh, interesting. I, yeah. So I, I was a pipe organ um graduate <laughs> but then when i went to canada i switched over to child study yeah tell me so, what what drove you into uh, into that field 
uh, into the organ or the no, into the field of child study. Oh, I just always got along with kids, and people used to tell me I had kid rhythma. The kids just loved me, and so I thought maybe I should, you know, expand this ability and find out how to do it right mm -hmm. and teach them all the good things in life. And you know, I just just kind of of thinking about um, your career, I know, you know, we mentioned that you've been writing for years. When did, when did writing start to, to kind of play a greater role in your life, whether it was for, you know, those grant proposals or direct marketing or things like that? Well, it always was a, a part of my life in school. I always got the best grades in the written word, not the mathematical field. <laughs> And we share uh, that in common. Yeah, if you look at my graduate record exams, you can see it right there. <laughs> um, so I just always liked writing, but more than that, I was always a storyteller. Mm -hmm. I learned that from my mother and from my mother's parents. They were all superb raconteurs. You yeah. just you wanted to I used I used to sneak when we visit the grandparents in Canada, I would sneak out after I'd been put to bed and lie behind the sofa and listen to the stories. And I guess I, I had that feeling of the importance of that. Yeah. So. So tell, when did it sort of cross your mind to, uh, to write a memoir? And, and what can you share with us about Remember Whose Little Girl You Were? Um, it all started in in Canada. Um, I went up there to go to graduate school, ended up staying 50 years. I always joke and say I wasn't that bad a student, but I, I got married, had children, had a career, and people in Canada loved my stories. And on two times when I left a job, the, they had a party and a card and everything on, on each of the two cards on two different jobs. People said, we're going to miss your stories. So I finally thought I should maybe write these down. Yeah. And so I did. I, I wrote them down. And that's what, what became Remember Who's the Little Girl You Are. It started out <clears throat> being called Southern Men. That was the name of the book. Mm hmm but when I met with the literary agent and he had read the book and he loved it, but it was all those stories of the boyfriends. He yeah. said, no, 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 expand this. I want to know more about the girl. And so I expanded the whole book and that's when I changed the name to remember whose little girl you are. So were there, were, were there a lot of men back, back in those days? <laughs> You're <laughs> blushing. Don't even ask me online how many times I've been married. I could probably find that out if I if I wanted you to create a lady of Google, but I'm working on the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> and that that I, I think I I'm not sure if we were on air when I told you about reconnecting with that man today who called me after reading my book. Yeah. Because he knew uh four of the men in it. No kidding. <laughs> He was from Montgomery, Alabama. Yeah. And so he was able to tell me what happened to them. And he agreed with everything I said. <laughs> and so I've said to him, let's, why don't we write a sequel? We'll call it what happened to the men that Ellen knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, just that there's enough for a sequel makes, um, and of uh, juicy stories for a sequel makes, uh, makes this one even more interesting, I think, or compelling to read. So, but I do love that title, Remember Whose Little Girl You Are. Um, you know, once you sort of expanded the the sort of scope, I guess, of, of the book, how did you land on that title? Well, when I expanded the book, instead of being the story of the Southern men, it was the story of the girl. Yeah. Um, and it was a phrase that my mother, who had four daughters. Uh, I was the second from the top. And she always said to her daughters when they left home to go to a party or even to a church meeting or anything, she would say, 
remember whose little girl you are. And it, you could take it two ways. Sure. You could take it, remember you're a preacher tower and behave your little self. Or you could say, remember you're my little girl and I love you a lot. Mm. How did you take it? Well, depending on how old I was, <laughs> I as a teenager, I took it more like, oh, God, I better behave. <laughs> but when I got older, I really appreciated it. Yeah. So it sounds like you left Canada and are now living back down south. Is that right? I am. I live on the very property that my parents lived on at the end of their lives. Wow. Uh, my dad retired in, uh, I'm not sure exactly what year, but in 75, they bought this property on the water and built the house and lived lived in it. My mom passed away very young, as I mentioned before. And so my dad lived on to be 88, almost 88. And he stayed here and we all came down to visit him. And one of my sisters moved down to Fort Walton Beach to be close to him. And uh, that's just down the road from here. And we all came. Um, I've forgotten the question now. Sorry. No, no, no. Just a, just a homecoming of sorts for you, basically. Yeah, you're yeah. kind of moving back there. I've got yeah. a question. I, I see um, behind your right shoulder, mm -hmm. uh, there's a teddy bear on top of. Uh, what's that? What's the story behind that teddy bear? Oh, there, there's a great story behind that. Um, I was living in Canada. And I was on a friend's Facebook of who was from Pensacola. And I, I made a really little joke on another guy on her Facebook that I knew named Mike Ward. And he had said he had moved to Andalusia. And jokingly, I said, is that Andalusia, Alabama or Andalusia, Spain? <laughs> and that got him to respond to me. And it went back and forth and back and forth. Uh, ultimately, he lured me back down here to marry him. And he met me that first flight down. He met me with a little teddy bear in his hand. And that's a teddy bear? Yeah, that's wow. that's teddy bear. And he gave me another one later. He thought the teddy bear needed a little partner. Oh, that's the one next to him? Yeah. And uh -huh. then someone else was doing a charitable thing that had a teddy bear and she gave me one of those because I made a donation. And so those are where the bears came from. Very neat. Very neat. Um, now, is Mike still around? Yes. In fact, he's in another room. I closed the door so he wouldn't make any noise. <laughs> but knowing him, I think he's taking a nap. When he wakes up, he'll probably come barreling in and say hi. Now, is he in this book or will he be in the sequel? No, he could have been in this book because I have known him since we were 13 years oh, wow. old. We went to junior high and high school. And at the end of high school, I moved to Andalusia, um, which is why I was joking about him living there. Yeah. And he, um, but um, back then, and it's probably still true now, girls usually go out with boys that are younger than they are. And boys go out with girls that are older than they are. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I had it backwards. <laughs> boys go out with girls that are younger than they are and girls go out with boys that are older than they are. So yeah. we never went out together, we never dated, but we were, you'll see us in the yearbook side by side. Yeah. We were in the student council together, we were in the honor society together, you know, the, all, all those clubs and things. So we, we were friends, but never dated yeah but when he saw that i had um, made that remark to him on her facebook he got in touch and we ended up talking skyping um and decided we i would fly down and we would see what we thought and that was when i got the teddy bear <laughs> i think the teddy bear cinched it it's a cute story cute story so I decided to, but I, unfortunately I had to move down away from my son who teaches at the University of Toronto.
Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, he, he's a professor of Chinese literature, believe it or not. Wow. <laughs> totally Sounds fluent in Mandarin. Very neat. Very yeah. neat. Very well, interesting guy. What, how did you, what did you learn about yourself when, while writing this book? Did you have any sort of insights into yourself? I guess I examined quite closely how it felt to have to move so often and what effect it had on me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd always presumed it was a positive thing because it made me able to get along in any situation. Uh, I, and it also made me empathize with children of the military. They have the same, same thing. Yeah. But I think it made me more compassionate to strangers, no matter where they came from. And my family was very unusual for the time we were in. They were very liberal. Yeah. My dad fought the good fight to, to promote the cause of integration. And uh, he taught all his girls to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do have a, a couple of fun questions for us because I always like to try and get to know my uh, my guests um, by understanding um, certain things about pop culture. So I'm curious, Ellen, when you were growing up, um, did you watch a lot of TV? We didn't even have a TV for a long time. <laughs> well, when you finally had one, what were some of the things that you enjoyed watching? We didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have, when we moved to Pensacola, they gave us an air conditioner. <laughs> For one room and a television so that was when it started but um i remember shows like um that would now be considered racist things like amos and andy mm -hmm. and beulah um jack benny and rochester <laughs> so i always liked those those stories the best yeah it's certainly a different time what do you like watching now if anything Oh, right now I'm watching a thing called The Good Fight. <laughs> Do you know, are you familiar with that one? I've heard of it, but I haven't watched it. It's really fascinating. I have to say, you know, it's different every week. It's has some twist that you don't expect. Legal. It's a legal drama, right? Yeah, it is. It is. It's all law lawyers. And they just had a huge big thing on an episode about kill all the lawyers. <laughs> Thank you, Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, but please spare my brother. He's a lawyer and I'd hate to see him. Oh, okay. Um, how about music? Lawyer. What do you, uh, what were, what did you listen to growing up? What do you like to listen to now? Um, well, if, when you read the book, pay attention to the chapter on Bruton, because I talk about how I loved Hank Williams and how I learned Jambalaya, crawfish pie. Sorry, I've got a croaky throat today, so I can't sing, but uh, Jambalaya, crawfish pie, feely gumbo. I would sing that, and neighbors, when they had parties, would invite me over to sing it. And as a girl, I didn't realize they were probably making fun of me because mm -hmm. I used to, you know, really belt it out. But it was fun. So I liked country music, but at the same time, I was playing. I was taking piano lessons and practicing like crazy um, for classical music. And what I won the scholarship in to university was classical music, mm -hmm. not country, <laughs> <laughs> but I do love it still. Yeah. Yeah. And I really always adored Bob Dylan. Yeah. What a songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. What he was, I loved, I loved everything about it and the way his voice sounded and his songs still do. Yeah, no, he's, uh, he's, he's great. He's great. Yeah. Still, still making a go of it too. Yeah. Um, everybody's, everybody's still singing wagon wheel. <laughs> That's all he, it's been done a few times now, right? Yeah. Right. People forgot he wrote it. I think Yeah, he actually wrote my, um, my wedding song. Um, oh, what was that? Was to make you feel my love. Um, but it was, it was made famous by Garth Brooks and Billy Joel. Um, but Bob Dylan wrote it, yeah. Oh, you know, I, I probably don't have time for me to tell you a quick story about sure, playing the organ. Ahead. Okay, well, I, I was playing the organ for church services up in Dorado. And 
before, you know, when we went to the rehearsal and everything, the bride said, I want all these pop songs. And she gave me a list. And I said, well, you know, this is a church and I'm trained in classical church music, Bach, Beethoven, Buxtehude, but I'll, I'll work a few in at the beginning before everybody, when people are being see, seated. And the minister never got up with the fact that just as he and the groom were about to pop through the door, I launched into send in, send in the clowns. <laughs> and he said, they heard send in the clowns. I went, well, he <laughs> thought they better, maybe not better go in yet. <laughs> That's a funny story. Yeah. Um, how, how, if at all, was writing this memoir therapeutic for you? I guess um, I've always loved storytelling, but part of it was I wanted people to know that not everybody uh, who was white and living in the Deep South in the 40s and 50s and 60s we weren't all racist mm. some of us were quite liberal and i wanted people to know that because i don't think history made a big deal about that and that that, that was one of the reasons i wanted to publish it yeah and a very important reason i thought so yeah and if you could go back in time and, and give the younger Ellen, uh, maybe it was the girl seeing Jambalaya, uh, some words of advice, what would you tell her? What would you tell a younger Ellen? I would say to her, find out if there's a show like The Voice and get yourself out on, on that show. Get on the TV. Yeah, get on the TV. I wish I'd had a manager. Yeah. <laughs> I can't sing today. I'm having this throat, croaky throat thing that comes and goes. And so I can't sing like I used to, but you know, the throat doctor said to me, the best thing you can do is resume voice lessons. I did yesterday. Oh, good for so you. I'm going to sound bitter. Good for you. Well, tell me, where can people go and buy Remember Whose Little Girl You Are? Oh, wow. My website is the easiest place because you can order it whether you're in Canada, um, in the U.S., Timbuktu. I just ordered one for someone in uh, New Zealand because I found out to send her a signed copy. She's a relative. It was going to cost a hundred dollars. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I just had them send her one. So it, uh, my website is ellennichols.com and that's E-L-L-E-N-N-I-C-H-O-L-S.com. Right. And you can order it on there. It purchases the first thing that'll pop up. But do stop and read some of the reviews too. Oh, there you go. And what about? Uh, are you, you active on podcasts? <laughs> are you active on Instagram or Facebook? Any social media? You know, I'm I, I am on Facebook, but Instagram. I tried. I just never quite got got into that one because it was all about only pictures. And I started out putting pictures from the book. You know, when I'm back in the day, like when I was three years old and five years old, and I, so I, I should try harder. All right. Yep. Well, very good. Alan, thank you so much for uh, letting me uncork your story. I had a lot of fun. Well, I, one last little thing. Please. When I was a girl, my grandmother, the Canadian grandmother, called me a corker. Oh. She always called me corker. And I found out later that was something to be proud of. So thank you. Well, there you go. I uncorked a corker. <laughs> she would love that. I wish she was still here. <laughs> well, thank you, Ellen, very much. I had a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.